Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my fellow elite achievers, and welcome back to the Modern Leadership Podcast. This week has been super busy. You know, one of those up early, out late, focus on a bunch of project weeks, but somehow during the week, I carved out some time to sit down with today's guest, Dr. Joe Martin, and I'm glad that I did. I think you will be too. Dr. Joe is an award-winning international speaker, author, educator, and certified man builder. He's authored or co-authored nine books, including Are You the Man? 201 Lessons I Wish My Dad Would Have Taught Me. He has spoken to over 750 organizations, was voted National Speaker of the Year by the Association for Promotion of Campus Activities, and he is the host of the Real Men Connect podcast on iTunes. Joe, you and I were just a couple of real men. Are you ready to connect? And I'm always ready, Jake. <laughs> but it's exciting to have you on the show, and I really love kind of your background and your story and what you talk about. But for those who don't know Dr. Joe, can you give us kind of a background, catch us up to date of what brought you to the point you are here today? Jake, I'm going to give you the ESPN version, the highlight version of my life, because we can always um, dive a little bit deeper into the story as you wish. But I tell people my story can pretty much be summarized from rags to riches to ruin to redemption. <laughs> and so th those four stages kind of highlight my life. And I'll touch on each one of those very quickly. The rags part um, is that I grew up in abject poverty in one of the toughest inner city ghettos in Miami, Florida, in a place called Liberty City, um, home of um, um, raised in a, with a, in a single parent home with my mom, who was a teenage mother at the age of 16. And she had two kids by the time she was the age 17. And my dad was no longer in the household after I was two years old, but went through that um, with a lot of other things that can go along with that. With uh, you talk about violence, um, watching six of my friends die before I reached the age of 16. Um, I um, survived sexual abuse for three years of my life. So it was a pretty much a nightmare. That was the, um, the rags part, the riches part, even though I, I put riches in air quotes. Um, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school, uh, first to go to college, went to college, graduated early at the age of 20, top of my class. I was voted student of the year um, or student on uh, um, student of the of the year on our campus out of 10,000 students. And I was the only um, African-American male in all of my classes. I became the youngest professor ever to teach in the state of Florida at the age of 24, had my doctorate before I was 30 years old, was making a six digit income. We're talking about a quarter of a million dollars before I was 30 years old, had written three or four books by the time I reached the age of 30. So even though I wasn't, quote, wealthy based on where I came from, you could consider that being rich. But then the third part of my story, which is I call the, the ruined part, is because um, even though I had a lot of success as a male, I felt as a man. And I ended up um, ruining a 16 year marriage and lost um, half my wealth, um, almost lost my health. In addition to that, almost lost my entire family over um, my addiction and my problems, my inner demons, because I came from a, a very traumatic childhood, but I never dealt with it. I overcompensated by achieving. That's why I achieved so much at such a young age, but I didn't deal with it. So it ended up ruining my life. And then the redemption part came when after I had pretty much lost everything, a man stepped into my life and changed everything for me because he taught me for the first time what it meant to be a man. And that launched me into what I'm doing now as a, a full time um, business and ministry, which is a nonprofit organization called Real Men Connect. And we're a multimedia um, men's ministry. And we help um, those males become men by teaching them how to become better husbands, better fathers, um, better leaders in their home. Because I don't want to see a, a male go through what I went through until I became a man. It took me until I was 33 years old to get a clue to find out what real manhood was about. And now I'm remarried. That's part of the redemption story now. And I'm happily married. Um, I have two children. My son is in college. Um, he's hopefully going to graduate <laughs> in less than a year. And I have a daughter who's not my biological daughter, but you can't tell her that. And she's uh, 15 years old. And she's in high school. And my um, beautiful wife, um, she owns a, a fitness business. And we've been married for now for five years this year. And when people see us, they consider us a ministry and a business because we work with she works with women. I work with men and we bring both those um, groups together. Well, and I love it. 
I want to look at some of these stages and some of these steps that you went through. And I want to go all the way back to the very first stage. And you had this difficult upbringing. You had some challenges, but something in you created this drive to go after success. And you talk about your second stage being graduating top of your class and getting your doctorate and all that. And I got to ask you, is it was it something internal that drove you or how can we as achievers, maybe we haven't gone through the same background and struggles that you went through, but all of us go through challenges. How do we get that drive to go after what we really want, what we would define as our own success? Well, Jake, I wish I could say it was inspiration, but it was more out of desperation because I was desperate. And even though people hear that story about how, man, he overcame a lot. Um, I tell you, watching six of my friends die before I was 16, I have a dozen friends who were incarcerated. Uh, my mom, what I didn't mention, was also an abusive alcoholic. And so I had a lot of things going against me. And people hear that story. That what kind of launched me because I started working with school districts across the country. And you mentioned that in the intro. But when they hear that, they say, well, Joe, just like you just asked, Jake, how did you get the confidence? How did you get the drive, determination? And to be totally honest and 100 percent transparent with you, it was it was difficult. Um, I wish I, I wish I could sit here and tell you, man, I was so driven, so determined. I was suicidal from 12 to 16 years old and I was hanging by a thread. And the only thing that got me through it was my faith um, in God, even though I questioned God. And I kind of wondered did God you know, was he punishing me. And also, um, I would say my relationship with my sister and some close friends. And when I say friends, now I'm not talking about my peers. I'm talking about teachers who they didn't know they were helping by giving me hope. So I wish I could tell you that there was a formula and boy, you just have to go after you have to want it back now. And a lot of people will tell you that. But unless my story is unless they're different than me, I struggle every single day of wanting to give up, wanting to quit, wanting to kill myself and say this is not worth it. But every time I would reach the end of my rope, it's like God would send me an angel. And my sister and I couldn't even we didn't like each other, <laughs> but she would do she would bring food home. She would steal food to feed me. And she didn't know. I never told her I was hungry, but she for some reason, intuitively, she knew that she needed to help her brother. I was thinking about taking my life, taking my life. And then I would go to a class and a teacher would inspire me. I'm thinking about my seventh grade English teacher. She would say something. And I remember thought about giving up. And then this coach on um, on our football team asked me to go out for the wrestling team. And that gave me confidence. So I wish I could tell you there was a formula. There wasn't. I was desperate and living in desperation pretty much my entire childhood. And I just God gave me just enough hope to get to the next filling station or gas station to get some more hope to keep going to the next one. I'm hoping that. And I, I wish I could give you a, a formula. Yeah, and I wish we could dive in and really pull out a formula as well, because Joe, for every story of yours, there is thousands and thousands of other people who grew up in similar situations from you that didn't make it out or went down a path that that didn't result in their realization of their opportunity and their potential. And one of the things that I like to pull out from this story, a couple of things actually, one is you had something internal. You had, you took a step back, observed your life and really said, I can change. I can come out of this opportunity, out of this difficult circumstance and create opportunity. And it was that internal drive, whether it was, you know, God pushing you in a certain direction or whether you had, uh, you know, at the, at the moment of need, a mentor or a teacher that brought you, you had something internal that took you out. And for the rest of us, as we look at our own stories and our own challenges, and hopefully most of our listeners today are not going through the same kinds of challenges that you had, but each of us can look internal, find that spark of hope and move in the right direction. The second thing that I like to pull out from your story here, you talked about teachers that were mentors and they were friends. And it's really important to recognize that whether we are the teacher and the friend or whether we're the student, there are mentors and examples around us everywhere. And that's why I really like jumping on the podcast with you, Joe, because on your website, you talk about you're a male by birth, but you're a man by choice. And I want to jump into that a little bit because I think that distinction is so important. So what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is we just assume we live in a society and, and America has conditioned us to believe this. I'm talking about as men that we don't have a, de a, a defining role of what we consider what a real man is. And so typically we look, we, we define ourselves and our manhood by external things. And I call them the Asians. <laughs> I call them the Asians, Jake. And typically 
if you want to know what kind of man you are, and, and I'm talking about in society, and I'll get to what the real man is, is that we think, wow, if he has education, that's one of the Asians. So if you meet me and we're on a plane, you want to know where did I go to school? Oh, you went to Harvard. Oh, man. So that you're impressed by that. So typically we define our, our manhood by, by the Asians, education. Also, you want to know what I do for a living, occupation. So what do you do? If I told you I'm a brain surgeon, that's going to evoke some type of emotion in you to think, wow, he's he must be important because he's a brain surgeon or he's an astronaut or he's a professor in my case uh, when I was a professor. And so they're looking at the occupation. Also, if you hear that I'm a brain surgeon or um, some type of high um, corporate lawyer, you're going to look at now my compensation. So what we think defines us as man is how much money we make, how much money we earn, because that's going to earn us again that that um, that that respect that we want to get from other people. And so you got education, you got occupation, you got compensation. Then I then you have what I call reputation. They, you know, how many people do you know? Who do you know? Um, how many women, Joe, are attracted to you? Um, how many Twitter followers do you have? We define about how popular we are. And now I'm sure there's other definition that we use. But typically when I'm, I travel all over the country, I've been to every state at least twice, four different countries speaking and in, in, at men's conferences, um, school districts. And typically those are the questions I get asked. Where did you go to school? Um, what do you do for a living? So they just now they don't blatantly ask me how much do I make, but they can assume that if I'm sitting first class, <laughs> you know, and I'm and I run my mouth for a living, this dude must be doing this a lot, <laughs> you know. So he's got to be earning good money. And then how many books have you written? Oh, so he has to be well known by a lot of different people. So to me, I realized I, it took me until I was 33 to realize that that only made me a successful male in society's eyes. But that wasn't what a man was. Now, the obvious question in the elephant in the room is, Joe, if that's not what a man is and think about it, that's what we aspire for our children. We want our children to get a good education, to make good money, to be well known and popular and people like them and, you know, that kind of thing. And we, and we want them to have a good job. But to me, that's not what I want now for my son. What I really been now been teaching my son that what a real man is, a real man leads his family. And we say when I say lead his family, he leads it responsibly and he leads it spiritually. He leads his family. And what he also do, he loves and serves unconditionally. He laid down his life for his family. He serves them. It's not about what he can get. It's about what he can give to his family. Also, a real man leaves a legacy. He does, doesn't leave an inheritance, a lot of money. He leaves a legacy. He's not a situational man. He's a generational man. And also, and this is so key, and I think this is why we struggle in society as men today, and a real man teaches other younger men how to do the same, how to, to lead their family um, responsibly and spiritually, how to um, love and serve unconditionally, how to leave a legacy, and how to reach and teach other men how to do the same. And so if my son does those things I could care less about how much education he has. I can care less how much money he makes because all I need to do is look at his wife and says, what do you think about this kind of man? And I can look at his children and say, what do you think about this kind of man? And if they don't tell me this, if they don't say thank you, then I did not do my job as a father. That's what my role is as a man. I did not see that when I was younger, but I get it now. And so now is this the background with Real Men Connect? Because when you look at this, you talked about the Asians, and that's what the world teaches us, right? That's what when we go out to school, when we go into our social groups, when we even jump on podcasts and listen to podcasts, we hear a lot of people lecturing, teaching, and encouraging us to create success within the Asians. But when you talk about the three L's and a T, and I was hoping that we could get that fourth one as an L, lead, love, <laughs> leave, and then what, lecture or teach? <laughs> you know, the, the three or four L's there. This is something that's not really being talked about. It's something that uh, maybe it's we're a little shy to talk about it. And so when we talk about your the title of your company, your 501c3 is Real Men Connect. And I want to take that title and wrap it back to this looking at love, lead, teach, and this kind of thing. What does Real Men Connect mean? Real Men Connect is exactly what it sounds like. I, I, I have to give my wife a shout out for this because when I was coming up for the name, and praying on a name for this or this organization, this idea. Um, the first name I came up with was Real Men Connection. And then my wife says, why don't you shorten it to Connect? And I said, why shorten it to Connect? She said, Joe, because it implies action. And to me, and, and listen to what I'm saying, Jay, is that 
a good man cannot become a great man without the help of other greater men. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. I'm I'm big into mentorship. Yeah, so that's what. So you hit it right on the head. Mentorship. That real men connect with other great men. You know, I ask men all the time. I said, "Have you seen men more successful than you are?" They said, "Well, of course I have." I said, "So how how come they're not coaching you? How come they're not mentoring you?" Well, 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 um, um, because you haven't asked. And so that's what happened to me when I had all this quote success, and I put in success in air quotes as a male. Then I met a man when I was 33 years old who, with eight children, been married for 30 years, and I watched him in his environment. I saw him at work, and then I saw him at home. He was, quote, successful on the job, but yet he was just, and I say just, and I don't mean this in just, but he was just a school teacher. So I was making more money than he was. I was more educated. I had a bigger reputation than he had. I had a more prestigious job than he had. But this man was serving on his job. But when I saw him at home, he was a king. His wife adored him. You'd think that they were newlyweds the way she was acting towards him. His eight kids, five sons and three daughters, that they respected him and they wanted to be around him. They were clinging to him. And I'm looking, I'm like, what kind of man is this? (laughs) And so I got to spend five days with him. And to the point, I'm thinking, wow, I was never that kind of husband. I was never that kind of father. I had success on the job, but I didn't have that kind of success in the home. So what did I do, Jake? I went up to him, and when he was taking me back to the airport, I said, I know you have eight kids, but would you adopt just one more? (laughs) Have one more. And I asked him, I said, will you teach me how to be a man? It took a lot of humility for me to ask that because this man brought me in to speak, and he was looking up to me to help him with his kids at his school. And so I had to humble myself and say, will you help me do become the kind of man you are and do what you do? And that man has now been mentoring me and coaching me for the last 15 years. And in order to be mentored, in order to really have a successful mentoring relationship, I think you brought to the table exactly what you need to, and that is an open mind and a willing heart, able to learn and grow. Take that pride down and allow yourself to be taught. Now, there's one thing that you said that I want to go, I want to ask you about this because one thing that jumped out about this mentor of yours and this, uh, this teacher that you had, and that is, I felt like in your story that he was comfortable in himself. And I wonder if that comfortability of who you are, that comfortability of self, the role that it plays and how important it is. And the reason I ask this is because when you look at the Asians that you talked about, education, you know, we want to get good education so we can tell everybody, hey, I'm a PhD. Hey, I'm a JD. Hey, I've got this education. Because we're trying to be more than we feel inside ourselves. We're trying to show other people that we're better, that we're worthy. But then when you talk about this teacher, you say only a teacher. But this guy was happy in what he was doing. He was he is comfortable in self. And so I wanted to ask you about this comfortability in self topic. Yeah, and I think you just hit the, the key element and you kind of expose my secret when it comes to coaching. I, I coach a lot of men and I work with small groups of men. And now they don't know what I'm trying to do, but I'm gonna expose this now on the air. Brought it up. <laughs> pull back the curtain. <laughs> that's right. I'm gonna pull back the curtain and pretty much because I guess if I told them this, they'll think, that's all you're doing with me? I could do that. I, try, I could do that on my own. And the, the key is, if you were able to do this on your own, you wouldn't need a coach. That's right. <laughs> you wouldn't need a mentor. But you just hit it, Jay, that when I work with men, it's two things I'm trying to get them to understand. And you said it perfectly. One, I'm trying to get them to understand that you're more powerful than you think. You're more powerful because that mind thing. See, they and, and it goes to the second one. Now, they're more powerful than they think. They, they think they don't have enough. They think, I just need to go out and get something that I don't have. No, you already have what it takes. You just don't know it yet. So they need to understand they have more power, more, they're more powerful than they think. And here's the second one. And you just brought it up. They're more valuable than they know. They're more valuable than they know. See, Howard, my mentor, he didn't say, I'm just a school teacher. He believed his role was life changing in his position. Matter of fact, I didn't tell you what he was at the school. He wasn't teaching a regular class like English, math, or history. He was in charge of indoor suspension. (laughs) Okay, now think about that, Jake. He's working at one of the toughest and roughest schools, middle schools in Miami, in my old neighborhood. And he voluntarily chose to work with the roughest and the toughest kids who they quote said are bad behavior. They they can't learn kids. Yeah. 
because he believed his role was significant. So um, Howard didn't undervalue himself, and he believed he was powerful enough to make a difference. So when I meet these men, my job is to get them to believe they're more powerful than they think, and also they're more valuable than they know, and that their this all is wrapped up in their identity. That's what you're pretty much describing. Yeah. So I always ask men, and they think I'm being mean when I ask them, I say, who do you think you are? Huh? They come in with the problem. I say, who do you think you are? And they think I'm challenging them. No, but I'm asking them to really answer that question. Tell me, who do you think you are? Because that determines everything, whether or not you'll be able to learn from me, whether or not you'll be able to follow through and take action, whether or not you're going to be able to persist and push through, whether you're going to give up too soon, whether or not you're going to have the confidence that you need. Who you are, when you tell me who you are, that's all I need to know, who you think you are. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means you believe it, and that's going to dictate your action. Well, and it gives us a starting spot. It gives us a place to jump off and improve and get better. If we don't have recognition internally of our need to to grow, our need to change, then we get stuck in the rut and we never accomplish anything because we don't believe that we can. We don't feel internally that we can. And you as a coach working with them, there's not a lot you can do because you can teach them everything. It's it's like the old saying, right? You can lead a man to water, but you can't make him drink. And somebody has to have that desire. They have to have that thirst to get down and get that water when you bring it to them. And so I love this conversation. I want to go into You have this thing called the traits, the T-R-A-I-T-S of real men. I want to talk about those for just a minute. What are the traits of real men? Because, you know, Joe, I'm a man here. I'm a male. I want to become a man myself. Coach us a little bit on becoming real men. You know, and we've already discussed a few of those traits. I just didn't identify them as the traits because they're they're inherent in those things that we talked about, about about leading um, your family um, responsibly and spiritually about loving and serving unconditionally, um, about leaving a legacy, and about teaching others how to do the same. But I'll break them down to you to make them more specific. First of all, and we didn't t- uncover this, but I think this is so vitally important, and I think this is one of the biggest obstacles for men to overcome, is one, the traits of a man, and I actually label them T-R-A-I-T-S, the traits of a real man is that he's transparent. And boy, I got to tell you, that is tough for men. I work with hundreds of men locally and thousands of men across the country and getting a man to be transparent, you, it's like pulling teeth because he he lacks to trust because he's been hurt in the past. So he doesn't know if he wants to make himself vulnerable to other men. But transparency is so vitally important. Also, responsibility. He's responsible. We mentioned that about leading his family responsibly and spiritually, that he has to be able to accept responsibility and not make excuses. Remember, he's more powerful than he thinks and he's more valuable than he knows. So he can't push the responsibility on someone else. I tell men all the time, I understand your past. I came from a traumatic past. You heard my past, Jake. But my past just explains me, but it doesn't excuse me. I still have a responsibility for the choices that I make. And I made some bad choices because of my past, but I can't blame my past for it. Now, the A stands for accountability. This is another thing that we struggle with. Accountability. I tell women, and I, and I mentioned in women because women always come to me about talking to their husbands or to their sons or if in, their, in my wife's business, they say, Joe, how come I can't find a good man? Mm-hmm. I always ask them, I say, is your man, does your man have accountability? And they say, Joe, what are you talking about? And I tell him, I said, if you show me a man who does not have accountability, I'll show you a man who can't be counted on. And so when I mention accountability, I'm not talking about some man that's got another man in your life who's going to run your life, but he's going to hold you accountable to your truth, which you believe the kind of man you tell me you want to be, Jake. I need to know that as your friend, if you're being transparent and you said, man, Joe, I want to be a, an amazing dad. I want to be an awesome husband. I want to be an amazing leader on my job. Guess what my job now is your accountability partner. Are you making those right? Are you making consistent choices leading you to being an amazing husband, a great father and a great leader? All I'm doing is to keep you in check and hold you accountable to what you told me you want to achieve. So that's accountability. Here's another big one. The I stands for integrity, integrity. And we've heard this word so many times. My son and I, I, I wear a band around my wrist. You can't see this, obviously, Jake, but And it's on my uh, right wrist and it has integrity on it. On my left wrist, it has it's not about me. I've worn these bands now since my son was in middle school. And I tell you, he's now in college right now. He wears the same bands. Now, when I gave him these bands, he says, Dad, I understand it's not about me. He said, but I don't understand. What do you mean by integrity? And I told him, I said, Kendall, integrity means doing the right thing 
for the right reasons in the right way, even when it's not popular, even when no one is looking. That is what integrity is. So I say, even if no one sees you doing it, do the right thing. A man of integrity keeps his word. And then the next T is teachable. And what did I do with Howard when I mentioned Howard? I had to humble myself and said, I don't have the answers. Now, you mentioned you say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I tell my students when I used to teach college students, I said, you can lead a student to wisdom, but you can't make them think. Yeah. And so you have to be teachable to say, I want to learn. I don't have all the answers. I don't know. Will you help me right now, Jake? I'm um, coaching and mentoring a man right now who's 83 years old. He's 83 years old. He's been married longer than I've been living. And he came to me one day after one of our group meetings and he says, Joe, will you teach me how to be a man? I'm like, what? (laughs) Young enough to be his grandchild. Right. And he says, Joe, I don't know. He said the stuff you're teaching and what we're learning here. No one has ever taught me that. And that's when I realized that wisdom has nothing to do with age. All age does is means that you're old. Doesn't mean you learned anything. And so you have to be teachable enough to say, I don't have the answers. Will you teach me? And the last one, and we mentioned this when I said that a real man is willing to um, love and serve sacrificially, there's the S, servant. He becomes a servant. It's not about him. That's why I wear that band on my left wrist. Joe, it's not about you. It's about what you can do for others. How can I be a blessing to you, Jake, on your podcast? What can I do to add value to his podcast? It's not about real men connect. It's not about me right now is about your listeners. And there's a man out there who's listening to this who I want to serve. So to me, those are the traits of a, of a real man. And you laid him out so beautifully. I love him. I want to go back over him just really quickly so that the listener ca- catches up with him. Transparency, responsibility, accountability, integrity, teachable, and servant. And I love these. I love how you laid him out. You're absolutely right. There are many men listening to this podcast right now and many women, frankly, that can use these traits in their lives. One of the things you talked about that I just love, you said wisdom has nothing to do with age. And you talked about this 83-year-old man. And I just want to say that no matter where you're at in life, no matter what age, no matter what level of worldly Asian success that you've reached, there's always more that you can do. There's always lessons that you can learn. There are people around you that can teach you at any stage of your life, whether you're 83 or whether you're 23 or whether you're 13, having the desire within yourself to learn and grow, to take on these traits of a real man, I think is incredible. Joe, I love our time together. I wish we could go into the three types of relationships and the five types of men. You have nine books, and so we'll just encourage them to go read your books and go check out your website. But before we let you go today, We want to connect with you on a different level. We've talked business. We've talked real men. Now I want to talk about you and get to know you just a little bit by finding out what you're reading and what you're watching. How does that sound? Sounds great to me, man. Wonderful. Okay. So we're looking at your bookshelf right now. And what are you reading? Right now I'm reading Eyes of Honor um, by Jonathan Weldon. Um, Awesome, awesome book. Well, give us a little background. What's this Eyes of Honor? Is it a a historical? Is it? No, it's not historical. It's actually a book that I think is mistitled. And and if Jonathan Weldon ever hears this, I'll say, dude, you should have changed the title. (laughs) And the the Eyes of Honor was really, it's a book for men who are struggling with um, lust and temptation. I work with so many men, and I got to tell you that probably the number one hangup that I deal with with men is dealing with pornography, lust and temptation, sexual temptation, and being remaining sexually pure. If women understood how much men struggle with this, they would probably freak out. But so I'm always looking at resources I can share with men. And so one of my um, men in my community recommended this book to me. And when I read the book, it blew my mind And because it's, it's deeper than just about dealing with temptation and lust and pornography. That's why I think it's mistitled, even though that's the focus of the book is really about what we talked about earlier, Jake, about identity, about knowing how powerful you really are and knowing um, how valuable then you then you really um, believe you are. Because if you get your identity right, and this is true in most of the great books that I read, that if you get your identity right, your actions flow from that. You are not your actions. You are your identity. And it's who you think you are. So he talks about some uh, temptation and lust, but it's really about identity. Well, and I, I'm thankful for you to break that down for us because I think you just sold a couple of books for uh, this <laughs> author uh, by breaking that down. 
it's a it's an awesome book, man. Well, thank you. Okay, the best movie ever made. Oh wow, man! The best movie ever made. I would say it'd be The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. Which has no words, right? Or it's in a different yeah, it's, language? Yeah, it's all subtitles. Yeah. <laughs> no words. But the reason why I said that's the best movie for me that I've ever watched, because no movie has ever moved me like that movie to um, that. I mean, it pretty much I didn't know anyone else was in the theater. It was like so it was a personal story for me. So that was the best movie I've ever watched. And I've watched it several times. And I, and I, and I have to temper myself and watch. I can only watch it once a year because it's too emotional. You know, and I have not watched it. Of course, I've heard it and and I've seen it around. I have not personally watched it. And you've got me intrigued and interested to really take this emotional uh, internal journey through this uh, movie. How about your leadership superpower? Oh, man, my leader, my leadership superpower would be my hunger for wisdom. And I, and I let me qualify that my hunger for God's wisdom, not man's wisdom, but God's wisdom. Um um, there's a scripture that says, I believe it's James um, 1, 5, that says, um, if a man lacks wisdom, let him ask the father who gives to him generously without reproach, and he will give him wisdom. And you have to know me, man. I am a fanatic when it comes to learning. I love to learn. I love to learn as well, and that's why we talk about books, and I, I keep a book list and a book club, and I just love to learn in this wisdom, and I love that quote there, the scripture that you read. How about a motivational quote or philosophy or mantra that Dr. Joe lives by? Uh, I'm already laughing from while you're asking the question, because my if I have any of my students who are listening to this, they said, there he is. There he is. He's at it again. My most famous quote that I'm known for is that I tell my students and anyone, I say students, it's not just the students I taught at college level, but also with the men that I work with. I say, if you want to be successful at anything, whether it be a husband, father, CEO, Businessman, it's very easy. Watch what most people would do in a given situation and do the total opposite. <laughs> that's my that's my famous quote. If you want to be successful at anything, just watch what the average person would do in that same situation and don't do that. Do the total opposite. I said nine times out of ten, you're going to be more successful than the average person. In that ten time, you're going to prison, but it's worth the risk. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I hope we're not ending up in prison, but I love this. Do the opposite. Well, I, haven't, I haven't ended up in prison yet, Jake, so I'm good. <laughs> well, and you've got a tremendous speaking ability. You've got a tremendous way with words, and we've really enjoyed having you on the show. I do have one last question, and that is the best business book ever written. It has to be something by John Maxwell, and I'm, I'm losing it. I think it's called The Power of Influence. Yeah. Uh, the Power of Influence by um, John Maxwell. And even though I said that's... I'm saying that now because I'm a big John Maxwell fan and his books on leadership has just been phenomenal. But I'm telling you, if you gave me more time to think about that, I'm probably because it's, it's about at least. And you know what? Matter, matter of fact, if someone wants to find out some of the best leadership books I've ever written, all I have to do is go to my website and click on um, resources, men resources. They'll see I have a book list of leadership books that I recommend. Well, I love it because we're going to link up to that. You know, Joe, if you go to Amazon, there are millions of books. It's almost impossible to sort, search through them all and go by title, go by book cover and try to find a good book. So we always ask our guest experts on the show what they're reading and what their favorite book is so we can kind of reduce that number down to a manageable amount so that we can find some good books and that we can learn. And so anything by John Maxwell, you get my full endorsement on that as well. And we'll link up to your website. We'll send them over there and see what else you recommend. Before I let you go, Joe, this has been an awesome interview. I love Real Men Connect. I love what you're teaching. I think it's so valuable and so important. In the pre-intro, you talked about that you have two sides of your life, that you talk a little bit of business, a little bit of of men, but you also taught Christian values and Christian ideas. And you said, you know, how much do you want me to tailor that or cut it out of the podcast? And I said, look, I want you to be transparent. I want you to be who you are. I want to talk about anything that comes to your mind. And I love the direction that we've gone. I can't thank you enough. Before I let you jump off though, how can we learn more? And then how can we pick up some of these books that you have? Well, Jay, just for your, your listeners on Modern Leadership, which I appreciate you bringing me on the show, uh, we set up a page just for your listeners. And all they have to do is go to realmenconnect.com um, slash or forward slash ML, 
ML for Modern Leadership. And we have uh, free gifts over there away from them and resources that they can download. And they have access to everything that we have. And they can also reach out to me through that as well. So that's realmenconnect.com slash ML. Perfect. We're going to send everybody over there. Love what you're doing, Joe. Thanks for taking some time this morning coming on the show and really imparting your wisdom and value to the Modern Leadership audience. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Well, a huge shout out and thank you to Dr. Joe Martin for coming on the Modern Leadership Podcast. I got to tell you, this interview was huge for me. I loved it. I love having this conversation about how to be a real man, about what I can do in my life and in my family, some of the lessons that I can teach, but also some of the lessons that I need to learn. I love the traits. We already went over them. I'm not going to go back over them right now, but boy, I tell you, I have pages of notes. I have multiple pages of notes as I sat and talked with Dr. Joe Martin. And so for this quick wrap up, I just want to focus on the three L's and the T that he talked about. You know, we talk so much about the Asians, right? Education, vocation, uh, compensation, and all of these types of things, the Asians. But he shifted our mental focus. He had us focusing on leading our family, loving and serving the family, leaving a legacy and teaching others service. And I just love that. I think that really wraps up who Dr. Joe is Can't thank him enough for coming on the show. Of course, everything that we talked about is on the show notes of this episode, which is jakeacarlson.com slash ML55, episode 55. And that's where you can connect with Joe and get the book recommendations and everything that we talked about. Until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life. Remember that you're not too old or too young to seek wisdom and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh